We're going to start in 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you've got your Bibles, your outlines. And we're going to continue part 2 of last week on the emphasis, of course, of spiritual warfare, waging a good warfare. And we're looking at part 2 on the war on your life. The War on Your Life, Part 2. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, you can look at it there. He says, and this is a scripture we looked at last week. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you might fight the battle well. That's I think that's the NIV there, but that's a... a good way of translating that. So what's Paul saying here? He's exhorting Timothy over the prophecies that were given him. And he was to fight the good fight with those prophecies in mind. And the enemy was attacking Timothy in the area of those prophecies, which would be God's purposes for him. We talked about that last week. So I'm going to talk to you, continue talking to you about the war on your life. Because there is an attack on individuals, there's attacks on neighborhoods, communities, churches, nations. The enemy attacks across the board. And there is definitely a war happening in our midst, individually and corporately, as a church and as a nation. But let me show you, let's start off, and if I want to develop something here, we've got to start with Ephesians 1.4. And it says... According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now just look at that verse. It says, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. The verse before that, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now that word blessed sets us up for this, this verse here. So when he chose us before the foundation of the world, now many of you know this, but for those who are new, they may not have heard this, and it's vitally important. When he uses the word blessed in verse 3, and this is verse 4, he's setting us up for something in that choosing before he created the heavens and the earth. He chose us before the foundation of the world. So that means before God even created this world, he chose you. And in the word blessed is the Greek word eulogy. And we know what eulogy is because we'll go to the funeral and someone will give a eulogy over somebody who's already lived. And so they, they're going to tell you what they've already done. But in this verse, or this Greek word blessed, you can get out of that, that he does a eulogy over us before we're born. So if I do a eulogy over you, I'm going to say to everybody what you did, but when God does a eulogy over us before the foundation of the world, He's going to tell us who we're going to be and what we're going to do. So He spoke that. The word's logos. He spoke that. In blessing us and choosing us, He spoke our name out loud. Before the world was created, He spoke your name, called you into existence of what you would be and what you would do. That's where we get Ephesians 1.4. And if you go to Ephesians 1.11, which is the next verse... It says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, already predetermined, because he chose us, called us, according to the purpose of him. Now we are called, chosen, predestined, according to the purpose of him. Not what you want, but what he's already planned out for you, mapped out for you. Predestined, according to the purpose of him. Now watch this. The purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. So that means everything happening in your life, good, bad, ugly, he's working it according to the counsel of his own will. So you don't got to worry about what God's up to. He has made a commitment when he spoke it. He spoke what he was going to be doing in your life, and then he's going to work all those things into your life after the counsel of his own will. So you can never... I mean, I know we do this, but never say, God, what are you doing? Or can you try this? Or what about that? You have to see that everything coming down the pike, even if it's the devil doing it, God enters into that and works it according to the counsel of his own will. 
Now, when, now we, this verse has been debated for years, but you can't look at this verse and say, God made this bad thing happen to me. Because then you have to erase the existence of a devil. So what you've got to see is while God has made a purpose. Now, let me ask you this. When he, when he chose you before the foundation of the world, I don't believe Satan had fallen yet. When he spoke your name, there was nothing yet evil in the, in the because the world wasn't created yet to be evil in the world. Adam and Eve wasn't even created yet. So when he spoke your name, this is what I'm going to do. Then evil comes into the world to fight what he says he's going to do in your life. Why do you think, you know, we all believe everybody has these angels around them. And you hear people talk about that all the time. I don't doubt that. I believe that. They're, they're sent to minister unto us. But there's also a set of demons set out against you individually. And so you're right, while you're trying to fulfill, and we really shouldn't use the word try, but while we are doing the will of God by the Holy Spirit empowering us, there's going to be resistance to God's purpose in your life. And so when, God, when the enemy brings something in, rather than let it take you out or get you disturbed or discouraged, you've got to go and say, nope, he's working this, this thing. And I, and I know it's bad, but he's working it according to the counsel of his will. All right? Then, if you look at Psalms 33, 11, you see that the plans of God stand firm for how long? So the plans of God, the plans He spoke over your life before you were born, those are plans, and they stand firm. Now, I don't care what the devil tries to do to you down here, and he's going to try to do everything he can, including throwing the kitchen sink at you, whatever he can do, but you got to know that no matter what the enemy does, the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through how many generations? Are you a generation? Now, will God's plan stand firm in this generation? So don't get moved by what you see happening in the streets and what's going on in governments and what's going on in this world today because God's purposes are going to stand firm. Now, you can believe the lies and get full of fear and doubt and discouragement, or you can go to the Word and see the plans of the Lord stand firm, and if the plans of God stand firm, then I'm going to stand Having done all, I'm standing because I know his purposes stand firm throughout all generations. Okay? And then you look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, so this is why I don't get too disturbed by the crap that happens or the bad that happens because I know God's working everything according to the counsel of his will and working it together for good to those who love God. Now watch, to those who are called according to his purpose. Not yours. In fact, he may allow the enemy to come in to destroy your purpose if it's not God's. And then you've got to say, okay, not my will, but your will be done. Like Jesus did. Now, got your outline there. We're at D. Now, here's, I'm going to set you up for some stories we're going to look at. But what's going to cause us to get weak and fearful and doubtful and frustrated is we're going to see that it takes God time to develop his plans in your life. Okay? Called the length of time. We want it now, and he says, nope, it's going to be a process. There's going to be a length of time regarding his pro promises and purposes in your life. And God is using this time to build your character, to get to get make sure you have the right thinking, especially of him, of God himself. And let me just share this. Every place of trial that Israel found themselves in the Old Testament was a place God unveiled himself, such as healer, deliverer, provider, refuge. What do I mean by that? Now, in this process, this length of time, while you're waiting on God to fulfill a purpose or a plan or a promise or whatever it is you're waiting on God for or trusting him in, you got to understand that length of time is where you're going to get completely turned upside down at time. Let me do this. There is the process of promise, and I know we've done this a million times. Promise given. I don't know. You think of the time, and when you got that word, or you're reading the Bible, and you've got something, you're like, this is great. You're happy, but between promise given 
and promise fulfilled, I don't know how long. How long, O oh Lord? Right? And in between this time is when he starts developing your character. Because if he gives you the promise when he gives it to you, you're not ready for it. So the promise is going to prepare you for the or prepare you for the fulfillment of it. And in this time, he's going to use the enemy, because he's there, all the attacks. And while all that's going on, he's going to be giving you a right mind, because we're supposed to be renewing our mind. He's going to be teaching you about himself, so that when you get to this place of fulfillment, <clears throat> he has already built your character, caused you to be rooted and grounded more so in him, so that when you get to this place of promise fulfilled, you're ready for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or it doesn't? Mm -hmm. This is your point of contention. Right here. And if you sit there and tell me that you never get aggravated about God and how long it takes and how long, oh God, you try this. then you, This is what kills me. During this time, you got these preachers on TV telling you how you can get it now. They want to speed up the process. You can't do that. I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to believe this. And I just thought where... I always say this. If you want to see where the church is going, look at where our nation is going. And where our nation is going right now is not a very good place. We're not at a good place. But neither is the church. Because one of these guys on TV, that if I said his name, you'd know it. Faith teacher. I got something in the mail just a couple days ago. And I'm like, I'm not opening it. I don't even open them anymore. But something had me open it. I opened it. And he's, he, he's trying to sell me his CDs and DVDs. But here's his teaching, his new teaching. Is that the prodigal son was able to get his inheritance now. And God wants to give us our inheritance. We don't have to wait for it. We can have it now. And I'm like, oh my God, that was the problem with this kid. He wanted it. Was he ready for it? Hell no, because he went out riotous living, spending it on prostitutes and drugs and whatever else. He, and, and you think God, a heavenly loving father, who, this is just the story of the prodigal, but God's not that father in that respect. He's not going to, and if he does give you what you're wanting, and you're not ready for it, you're going to crash and burn. So you better say, God, hold off. Because he gave Israel food when he didn't want to give them food. And so he gave them food and it rotted in their mouths while they were eating it. So you don't want to always get. And this guy's trying to get the church to speed up the process. We, they want to go from here to here without this. It doesn't happen. That's not even reasonable. But then when I, thought, when I saw that, I'm like, my God, we're using a story in the wrong way so we can get our stuff. I, I just have problems. I just have problems with stuff like that. Every place of trial that Israel found themselves, I'm still at F. So in other words, let's look at Israel in this respect. God gives Israel a promise, the promised land, right? He makes a promise to them, promised land. And they are in Egypt when they get this promise. Here over here is the promised land, Canaan. Right? What do they got to go through to go from here to here? Wilderness. And during this time of wilderness is when they began to learn who their God was. Remember I said, He's going to give you a right mind so that when you get over here, you know who your God is. So every place that Israel goes to, check it out if you don't believe me. Go start reading the Old Testament again. You find out when they come up against a hard time, God unveils an aspect of Him and delivers them. So He's deliverer. He heals them over here. He's healer. He provides for them over here. He's provide. He is revealing Himself while they're going through the wilderness. And while you're going through the time of waiting, of God fulfilling everything in your life, He's trying to teach you who He is. So when you have something going on right now, we want to curse it. Or like that guy. We want our stuff now. I don't want to sit here and wait for it to come later. I want it now. And God's like, no, there's things I want to show you before I give you, before my purposes come or plans get unraveled or unveiled or however you want to look at it. The fact is, I've got a lot to show you and I want to use life to show you who I am. You can't erase life. You can't erase what's going to happen today. 
I know I don't want half the stuff to happen to me that happens to me. But God says, I'm working something here. Everything is being worked out according to my eternal purpose, Ephesians 1.11. We just looked at it. So I can't speed up the process, and I can't pray away situations and circumstances. You know, we're praying, oh God, take this away. And God's like, no. This is going to unveil who I am more in your life. So you know what we don't want? We don't want the afflictions of life, and we don't want the sufferings of life. We, we somehow think that we can bypass that. And God's like, no, that's part of the journey. That's part of the process. You will learn me and who you are in me by the process. How many of you have learned God in a greater way by something that afflicted you? It got you to seek God, didn't it? It got you on your knees. It got you in the Word. It got you praying. And you're like, whoa, I see that. Well, if it wasn't for the affliction, you wouldn't have saw God. Half of us wouldn't come to church if we're not afflicted. We, we, we reserve church for bad times. And the good times, we stay away. Don't we? Maybe not us, but a lot of them do that. A lot of people do that. So the resistance of the enemy, so you got God trying to teach them through life, life lessons, if you will, and then you got the enemy attacking them on top of that, and so God will use the resistance of the enemy to even prepare us for what he's raised us for. God using evil and turning it for good. And then Paul says, there, and I think it's 2 Corinthians 4, this momentary light affliction. Now he's not against affliction because he's accepting it. He says this momentary light affliction is working for us. Don't pray it away. It's working for you. An eternal weight of glory. So we have to see the way the church is teaching us today is to avoid affliction, avoid suffering. You can't do that. You live in a fallen world. Show me where you can go where sin's not going to touch you out there and I'll move in that neighborhood. Does that city exist? So what is this all whole lot trying to get into a utopia that doesn't exist out there? No, we need to see that while we're in this world, Jesus said it, John 16, 1, in this world you'll have what? Tribulation. Tribulation. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. You're going to get through it because I have already overcome the world. So whatever the world throws at you, you will overcome it. But it will be a light affliction. It will be an affliction. But, you, but we are to endure these times of ups and downs. Make sense? All right, so let's look at these guys, because if I didn't lay that groundwork, now let's look at some, some characters here, and we'll, we'll start with Joseph. Now, Joseph gets a dream. Look at the board here. He gets a dream, and that dream is everybody's going to bow down to him. How long did that dream take? 17 minutes? 17 years, give or take a few. That's a long time. Well, what was the process? The enemy attacked him right off the bat with his brothers. Did he not? So here, here the enemy is attacking the dream because it's the purpose of God. Understand, it's the purpose of God. What is the devil after? The purposes and plans of God. Not you, the purposes and plans of God that you so happen now to be part of. Now when this dream comes, you just look. See, we've always taught this. I don't know if you've been taught wrong or not this story, but we always look at it as, oh, how bad the brothers are, and all oh, Egypt's a face of slavery and all this. But you have to understand, let's, let's, let's pull the curtain back, and the devil sees this dream because he speaks the dream to his brothers. He speaks the dream to his dad. The enemy now gets, and he gets, gets wind of it and gets jealousy into the brothers. And the brothers start attacking him. So, where is this dream? I guarantee you Joseph would have never thought this dream would have been fulfilled anywhere else but in his own hometown. So where did the dream get fulfilled at? Huh? Egypt. Wow. So how am I going to get to Egypt? Whoa, buddy, you wait till you see what's going to be happening to your life. Pit, you're going to be sold to... Um, to, to Ishmaelites or whatever, or 
and then you're going to be taken to Egypt and be sold as a slave there. You're going to be accused of rape. You're going to end up in prison. Is that, you think he would have been happy over that dream if he knew what was going to happen to him because of that dream? <gasps> Take the dream out of the equation. Anything happen to Joseph? No. Pimple-faced pimple kid who's just getting picked on by his brothers periodically. But that's about all he's going to, going to grow up to be like everybody else. That dream marked him. Marked him by God and marked him by the devil. And look what he's got to go through for that dream to come about. So let me tell you, when, he, when Paul told Timothy, those prophecies that we've given you, they have to do with your life, you're going to enter into a war. Because the devil's not going to want those prophecies to come to fruition. You're going to have to war the devil in regard and with those prophecies. So he was, Joseph's going to have to grab that dream and hold on tight and get ready to endure some affliction. Right or wrong. So now we find him in, in, at the end. He doesn't know it's the end. It's been about 17 years. He's in prison. I'm going to ask you this question. Because God asked me this question early this morning about Joseph. Was there anybody in Egypt that wanted him out of prison? That, I mean in, in a place of authority. That he could write a letter to. Is there a governor that's going to give him, what do you call that? Pardon? Or a president? It's a, it, it's an end of his term. We give out all those pardons. None of that. This man did not have a snowball's chance in hell getting out of prison because he's a slave number one, and he supposedly raped an official, an official's wife. So the whole nation's against him. There is nobody in the cabinet of Pharaoh that even wants this guy out. He's a rapist. And if he would happen to get out, he would have to um, sign up as one of those um, sex offenders everywhere he lives. And this guy, it, come on, what are you going to do with him? He, really, he's sitting there, I'm screwed. This, this is it. I have no chance at all getting out of here. And you can see him fighting that dream. With God. Did you not give me that dream? Did you not say this? Did you not do that? And I've got nobody down here to help me. He'd have a better chance of his brothers making that dream come about than the people in Egypt. Nobody wanted that dream to come about. His own family and where he was in a foreign land. So how did God get him out? Remember what we said. That's not up there, but that's okay. Go back one. Psalms, Psalms, uh, yeah. The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. So what, if he knew, if he, I don't know what Joseph knew, but if he knew that, he'd be sitting there going, it's just a matter of time because I don't care if everybody's against me. I got, a, I got a purpose of God that stands firm forever through all generations. Mm -hmm. So what, how, how'd God get him out? By making them need him. He had a gift of interpretation, of dreams. God knew all along, hold on, Joseph, I know they're not, they, they all hate you, but they're going to want you because you got something they need. And now he interprets the dream and he's everybody's golden boy. Sex offender to now second in command. You see, you see how you, 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 you got to see, don't let the pit. The slavery, the false accusations, the imprisonment, it can get hard. I tell you that Satan will even throw the kitchen sink at you if necessary. But you have to stand firm, having done all stand. Why? Because his purpose is stand firm. I'm not going to fall over while his purpose is stand firm. I'm required to stand because his purpose is stand. That's good stuff. I'm just telling you. Now look what Joseph says at the very end. Genesis 50. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. This is all said and done. You know the story. You know, his brothers come there and they're afraid because they think he's going to get, get them back for what they did to him. His dad's dead. But he says, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Now look at this. For am I not in God's place? I guarantee he wondered if he was or not. But now looking back, he can say, oh my God, this was all a setup. This was all a setup. 
Now watch. Am I not in God's place? How many can say that right now where you are and what you're going through? Be like, There's no way I can be in God's place. You can't believe what happened here, what's there. I did this, he did that. I mean, come on, I'm trying to get out of this place. No. When you understand the sovereignty of God and he's working all things after the counsel of his will, and we, there's a lot more scriptures, then you're going to have to say, you know what, I don't understand what's going on here. A lot of it I brought on myself, absolutely. But a lot of it I didn't too. So I don't know what's going on. Oh, I know it. I'm in God's place. You have to understand because if you're not in God's place, then His purpose for you can't stand. But I sinned. You don't think He didn't see the sin coming that you would commit that would cause this, that, or the other to happen? You're not going to tell me that, they, that God didn't see the sins of those 12 boys or 11 boys to put the one in the pit and sell him? And tell his dad he died? You don't think God didn't see that one coming? Or the false accusation of rape? Well, God did that. Did God do all this evil to Joseph? Read on. As for you, you meant evil against me. Yeah. The devil used you. Where does the evil originate from? You let the devil use you against me, but God, what? Meant it for good. That's God entering in. So you can, you can go, well, look at the evil that I've done. Look what the evil's been done to me. Look, we can play that game all day long because there's no one that doesn't sin. Okay, there's no one that's completely like, you know, I don't ever make mistakes. I don't ever think bad thoughts. I, everything I do is perfect. Wish that was true in our spirit, man, it is, but we've got this unrenewed mind that causes us to do some crazy things, especially when it gets deceived by the devil. But he says right here, as for you, you meant evil for me. That evil was unleashed. I just told you that. The enemy attacked him. God didn't accuse him of rape. The devil did through that woman. God didn't put him in prison. Evil put him in prison. Evil was against him. Evil was against the dream of God. And evil's against you. Let me just, I was going to stay, save this for the last, but it needs to be said, because otherwise you're not going to put yourself into the flesh and blood on this and put yourself in these stories. You have a Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and there are thousands of characters in that Bible. But I'm, I really believe this. I can't prove it, but I believe this, that when we get to heaven, there's going to be volumes called Hebrews 11, the, the feats of people's faith, the great things and exploits that we did down here, you say, what are, we going to do? what are we going to do in heaven? How are you going to glorify God? Remember how they said that they're all going to bow down and worship Jesus 24-7? What creates that praise and worship? Many things. Here's one thing that I'm entertaining in my head. Like I said, I can't prove it. Is that there is going to be books or videos, I don't know, where we're going to get to watch you and I in the crucible and rise up in faith and who's getting the glory in heaven by these movies that we're watching of ourselves coming up out of the pit, coming up out of prison, coming up out of the attacks of the enemy and triumphing over them? Who gets the glory from that, for those movies? If, if those movies exist in heaven, who would get the glory for it? God, because that would be God in us, right? See, we watch Joseph. This is the story here, and thank you, Jesus. But you have a story. There's no respecter of persons in the Bible. God can't put everybody's story in the Bible. We wouldn't have been able to read it. If every person that lived between then and Jesus in the Old Testament got a, their story put in the Bible, we would never be able to read any of it. it would, the volumes would be too big for you to read. So he's just highlighting some things. But I, I, you think that God's going to let your life go to waste and be forgotten in heaven? Those rewards in heaven are going before you. Your triumphing here is rewarded over there. And I think part of those rewards could be books about us. Movies about us. But there won't, don't, don't worry because there won't be a movie about you committing adultery and getting drunk. Because those are all forgiven and under the blood. Just like everybody in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 did some awful things but he never mentioned any of the bad things. He mentioned their triumphs because the blood covered the, the mishaps. That make sense? So I want you to see your life, that there is an actual war on you. This is where the Bible allows you to be somewhat of a narcissist. 
because it isn't about you, but the attack is going to be on you. And you've got to say, what is it about me that I am getting so attacked on here and there and all this? You've got to understand, there's got, there's, obviously there's purpose in your life or the attacks wouldn't be so heavy. Well, I don't get attacked much, Greg. Well, you better wake up and smell the coffee because you're doing the devil's work. He ain't attacking you. Hmm? All right, let me give you another one. Moses. That was Joseph. Moses, this is an interesting one. Moses was born to be a deliverer. Right? And when he was born, knowing that he was going to be a deliverer, who went after him? A baby. Why would Satan go after a baby, an infant? Purpose. That infant can't do nothing. To, that infant ain't harm, harming nobody. So how does the devil go after Moses? Because the Pharaoh puts out a decree to kill what? All the male babies. Well, they're not. His mom and dad ain't gonna have any, any of that. So they put him in a basket, and they send him on down the the, the stream with the sister watching to make sure he's okay. Well, who finds the baby? Pharaoh's daughter. She takes him, raises him as her own, and he becomes a, an authority and a leader, probably taking the throne someday in Egypt. That's what Moses is raised doing. Now, see, now watch, the attack happens when he's an infant. The attack continues because the enemy's gonna try to keep him in the pleasures of sin in Egypt. He's got to make a decision. Is he going to go the way of God or is he going to go the way of the enemy? So he's still under attack. He's groomed to be a leader in Egypt. Now, go to Hebrews 11.23. I think that's the next verse. By faith. Now, this is Hebrews 11. It doesn't say nothing about Moses murdering anybody, does it? But was he a murderer? Why you just write that off? He's, oh yeah, Moses is a murderer. But, Where's the stigma of Moses being a murderer like there's a stigma on Charles Manson? How come we let these guys get away with sin, but we don't let other guys... You know, there's a stigma with Hitler, there's a stigma with... Ever stigma with Ted Bundy? We don't have a stigma with Moses. Because I don't know if we even really believe he even murdered. Oh yeah, but do you... He's a murderer! How would you like to be the, the father and mother of the person he murdered? You going to let him off scot-free? Now we just think, oh yeah, he's a murderer. You've got to put some flesh and blood on this. He's a murderer. He took life. But you don't read about it. Because God forgave him. But he's not perfect. He's flawed. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's eating. By faith... Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We talked about this last week. Next. Choosing rather, now here's where I want you to see. Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So during this time of what God's going to raise him for as deliverer, he can either choose the pleasures of Egypt... Because we don't know how long this is going to be. Or he can go and, and choose the affliction of the people of God. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Two weeks ago, God gave me this scripture. And I don't even know, to be honest, I've meditated on it somewhat. Not enough. Because it's too weighty right now for me. So what do you mean? See, I'm on a particular path. Not your path, my path. I don't like it a lot. And there's things I try to change, or I go off here, go off there, trying to make my life a little easier, more exciting, more better, and it never works out. And you got to say, man, I, I guess the purpose that God has for me comes with it setbacks and afflictions that aren't. You don't have to go through them because they're they're not your. It's not your purpose. That makes sense. So in other words, think of it this way. We're all on different, and we are on different paths, but think of a literal path. Some guys might get pavement. 
I don't know why they get pavement. Some guys might get gravel. Some guys might have to make their way through an Amazon jungle. But they're all paths. Huh? You look at people and say, why is their life better than mine? I can't answer that except purpose. So you want to be used by God, but how much? Did you want to go through what Joseph did? Yes, over here. Give me the promise and quickly give it to me real quick. I don't want to go through that. So I don't know what... But every single one of us are called according to purpose. So I don't know what path you're on, but you've got to choose like, Mo like Moses did. I have to choose the affliction. This path puts me on a road of affliction to some degree. And the enemy's on the enemy's one afflicting me, of course, but I've got to stand firm and endure this thing because on the other end is fulfillment. All right? So um, he says that he... Considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of heaven. That means you'll choose to go without to get God's best. And I will choose this reproach. I will choose this affliction. And you can get out of it any time. How many of you know that any time you're under the gun, there's always a quick way out? You can fix it real quick. Most of the time you can fix something real quick. Other times, you can engineer, orchestrate a ways and means by manipulating people, forcing the thing to happen, or you can wait and endure the affliction for God to come through. Every one of these guys endured the affliction and waited for God. They didn't try to fix their problem. If they did try to fix it, it didn't work. Joseph tried to fix his problem real quick. Remember he said, hey, when you get out of jail, remember me? Did the guy remember him? Huh? No. And Moses tried to fix him real quick by murdering the guy, murdering the Egyptian slave and get this show on the road. Did he not? He murdered an Egyptian. See, I'm the deliverer. I'll start it. I'll start the deliverance right now with this guy. Didn't work, did it? Now he's in the desert for 40 years as a fugitive from Egypt. Now 40 years, what happened to the promise? 40 years in the wilderness, taking care of sheep. No one even knows where he's at. As far as he's concerned, it's over. He blew it. But did we not just read that the purposes of God stand firm forever? Yes. You might have, go, you might screw it up. He's not going to let you go. You may have to take the long way around or a couple laps around, you, but he'll bring you back where you're supposed to be. And then he goes on to say, For he was looking for the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured... Take note of that word, endured, as seeing him who is invisible or unseen. Next one, Abraham. Abraham's father of many nations. That's what he was told by God. But his wife is what? So I know you know these stories. We've talked about them millions of times. But they're written there for us, where you are right now. See, I know these stories really well. But God brought a few of them back to me this week that I needed to renew my mind on, that helped me through, got my head on straight. See, if your head gets screwed off a little bit when you're going through the pressure cooker, you can make a bad decision. But if you go back and renew your mind on these truths, you're like, okay, I know what's going on here. And that's what the devil doesn't want. Look at Abraham, father of many nations, but yet his wife is barren. Out of him is going to come Israel. Out of him is going to come the Messiah. It's a promise that God gives him with a wife that's barren. How am I going to be a father of many nations if my wife is barren? Hmm? Promise given. How long did it take? By the way, Moses was in the Joseph 17 years. Moses 40 years in the wilderness. How long does it take Abraham to get the promise of father of many nations before he even just gets one. 25 years. Think God's in a hurry with you? So don't be like the prodigal. I want mine now. Yeah, you'll screw it up. It's like giving a five-year-old a shotgun. So what happens? His wife is barren. takes 25 years. And the enemy begins to work on Sarah. So she comes up with the idea 
Are you ready for this? That we have a maid, and if you have relations with this maid, she can get pregnant. She's not barren. I am. She's not. And at least half of that boy will be ours. Yours, but ours. And so Abraham goes into the tent with the woman. She conceives. She gives birth. And as far as they're concerned, for the next 12 years, that's the one. Until God shows up and says, sorry, that ain't the one. The one I promise is going to come out of her womb. And they're like, oh God, here we go again, waiting for a dead womb to open. I mean, could anybody open that womb? Could, who, who, could Moses come out of the desert and go back to Egypt anytime he wanted? No, he's in the desert because he left Egypt. He can't go back because he's a murderer. The only way Moses gets to go back is God making it happen. The only way Sarah's womb is going to get open is God making it happen. The only way Joseph's going to get his dream fulfilled and get out of prison is when God makes it happen. Do you see in these three stories at this point, do you see any human ingenuity that God used to make his promises come about, his plans? They're screwed. Joseph is screwed. I told, that's why I told you there's no one in Egypt that wants him out of prison. Uh, Moses is screwed. He's in the woods 40 years. Everybody's forgot about him. Till that burning bush. And Abraham's like, oh God, now i got to get rid of this kid and wait for that barren womb. I mean, that's why we did this. Because nobody in that day could open up a womb but God. Do you know, you think, well, that's no big deal. Do you know who, the, who Ishmael is today? Huh? You say, well, it's just some kid. You know, yeah, he had a kid. Do you know that mistake or sin, I don't know what you want to call it, produced the Arabs? And the Arabs, are they really friendly with Israel? Who's Israel's worst enemy in this whole world? The Arabs. And you think that fight was going on between, because it says when, when, when um, Isaac grew up, Ishmael was taunting Isaac, and God had to say, cast the woman out and her son, because the two can't grow up together. What you see here is the work of the flesh. Those two cannot grow up together. And that's a spiritual of grace and law. And Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 4 that Hagar is the law, Mount Sinai. And it, that's why he says in Galatians 4, cast the bondwoman out, because it's the law. Cast legalism out of the church, because it's a work of the flesh. Even if you're trying to do it in a good way, it's still the work of the flesh. Does that make sense? I just want you to see that some of these things, when, we don't, when, we, when we're not renewing our mind on these stories, or trusting God and His purposes, we get off over here and we do something little, that little thing had repercussions that you and I face today called terrorism. Not all Arabs, okay? Don't hear what I'm not saying. So anyway, 25 years to bring this about. He gets to the land, has a famine, he's told that he's going to have a child, barren, goes after the promise, producing an Ishmael, and look at Romans 4.17. Let's watch this. Whom? Now this is what Paul has to say about Abraham. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. So after 25 years, he's 100 years old. He's done. He, 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 his body, at least, is done. Is dead. They can't produce. She, she is well. I think she's 99 or something like that. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise, you could also say yet with respect to the purpose of God promise of God. He did not waver in unbelief. He said, but he went into the tent with Ishmael. He thought he was helping God out. How many times did you think you were doing the will of God and only you were only in the way? He did not waver in unbelief. He still believed in spite of it all. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured during all this time between promise given and promise fulfilled, he was fully assured that what God had promised, God was able also to perform. See, that's where you anchor to get through these rough times. 
is you anchor yourself in the character of God who said, I'm not a man that he should lie. I'm not the son of man that I should repent. Did I not say it and will I not make it good? Let's hurry up here. Let's go to the next one. David. David's anointed to be king. Now you want to hold on because wait till I get to the end of this thing. I got something to say about what we're going through today. David's anointed to be king by the prophet. He's at age 18. And Samuel the prophet anoints him to be king. How long does it take him to be king from the time Samuel anoints him? Anywhere from 10 to 13 years. But it's not just go sit and wait, David, for your turn. What goes on in those 10 to 13 years? He's running from Saul for his life. He is the most wanted on the FBI list, and he's hiding out in caves. See, this isn't easy living. Up to this point, how is any of this easy living for these people? So David's known to be king, takes 10 to 13 years, and he's enduring all the threats, the circumstances that those threats give him. There's a time that he's not only running from Saul, but when he gets to Ziklag, his own men want to stone him and kill him. So where does a guy run when the enemy's against him and his own people's against him? See, we just read through there, yes, yes, mm-hmm. These guys went through it. And you think you're the only one going through what you're going through? No one is above pain and suffering, affliction and sorrow. Okay? we got to learn how to deal with it. So the enemy attacks David many times. He comes at him as a lion. Comes at him as a bear. Comes at him with Goliath. And now it's going after him with Saul. How would you like, and then his own men at Ziglag. How would you like to have all, when's this guy get a reprieve? See, you want to be anointed king? You ready to go, you, you want to tackle a bear and a lion? And a Goliath? I know, it's just, it's, you're, you're just being hard on us. No, I'm just telling you the truth. This is hard on David. And he endures every one of these guys I'm going to show you a scripture that should help you. Every one of these guys dug down deep and stood firm because they knew God's plan stands firm. And whatever came at them, they were standing strong, having done all stand, having done all stand. I can't tell you, yes, there's a fiery furnace there. And he's just heated it up seven times hotter. But I'm not going to bow. Stand firm. Stand firm. Well, what if they would have gotten killed? Man, what a testimony on the other side of standing firm. Or live the rest of your life knowing that you denied the Lord at the most crucial point in your life. You only got 70 years down here. How many crucial points do you think you're going to get? Not very many. Okay? And then David says in Psalms 37... I was young and now I'm old. Through everything David went through, and I, do, I don't have time to develop. I wish I could develop. I, shot, I probably should have done David by himself, Joseph, but I'm trying to get it all together. David said, after everything he went through, I've been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Why? Because God's plans stand firm. God's faithful. And that's what you've got to remember. Whatever you're going up against, God's going to get you through. Now, Victim or victor? Do you understand? Now I'm going to speak to you about the present times. Do you understand that governments, the elite that's trying to control you, wants to make you always a victim? You're a victim of climate control. You're a victim of the old people living their lives and making it hard for you young people to grow up in. Young people are a victim. Blacks are a victim. Christians are a victim. Everybody, they watch it. They design everything that comes through the media and even religion wants to keep making you a victim. A victim of what? The Three Stooges. I'm a victim of circumstance. Who said that? Huh? Curly. He's always a victim of circumstance. 
And if every one of these guys played the victim, you can't stand playing a victim. You fold playing a victim every single time. So whether you're a minority, whether you're even women, women are victimized. And, and don't get me wrong, there are reasons to... There, no, let's say this. Everybody gets to be the victim sometime. We're all victimized to some degree. But we're not victims. That's, that's a mindset. That's a mindset. And if you keep that mindset that you're a victim, the man, whoever the man is, will always keep you down. Satan will always keep you down through that man. you got to rise up and see who you are in Christ. The only deliverance from victimization is knowing your identity in Christ. And Christ did not cause you to be born again to be a victim. Every saved woman cannot play into the role of victim that's happening today on media. Every black person that's saved cannot play the role of a victim. The only way you do is because you have an unrenewed mind when you're not saved. But if you know who you are in Christ, you're not a victim. You expect this stuff to happen to you because there's purpose on your life. And the enemy's the one attacking you through man. I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I understand where my <coughs> pressure comes from. I, go, I look beyond the, the, the flesh and blood and go after the principality and power that's causing the flesh and blood to do what they're doing. That make sense? So you were not created to be victims. You were created to be victors in this life, overcomers. Yet the enemy and the world system is designed to make you a victim and keep you down and divide you from everybody else. Why? Because it keeps you from rising to your calling and destiny. Now, wouldn't that just make sense? If I was a black person, and I'm not, I'd say, look at the slavery we've been through. Look at everything that we've been victimized with, the racism and everything. My God, there must be destiny on my life. I ain't going to be a victim. I'm going to rise up in God, in Christ, and tear down the strongholds that's over my life. If I was a woman, they've been victimized. That women couldn't vote there for a while. Couldn't work. Couldn't do things. You can be the victim, or you can go, there is no gender. There is no black. There is no white, those that are in Christ Jesus. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I've got purpose on my life. And I'm going to rise up and fulfill it. Well, what about our, us white guy Christians? I guess we've not been victimized. The hell I haven't. You who know me how much I've been victimized and still am victimized by past sins. That, so we all are victims to some degree. All right, is that too hard? Jesus said the only thing's going to set us free is truth. But they keep lying to you. You're not a victim. How can you be a victim being born again, born new? That's what... You created me, recreated me, new man is a victim? Jesus never saw himself a victim. He proved to them that they, did they victimize him? Did he get on that cross? Get him, God. Get him. That one there especially. Victims want to victimize others. He proved he wasn't a victim by being the victor. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Hurry up here. Hebrews 11. All the ones we talked about just recently, just now, they're all in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews 11. By faith meaning they trusted God to bring to pass all that He raised them for. They trusted God to bring about the purposes and, and, and plans of God in their life. Only God alone, which is radical trust. Now look at this verse here, Hebrews 6:12. We do not want you to become lazy. Now, this is what Paul's saying to the church. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and endurance, that's the Greek word is patience, or the Greek word is endurance. King James uses patience, but it's endurance. Let me read it again. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and endurance, how do you inherit 
the promises of God and His purposes and plans? Endurance. Faith and endurance. I know God said it. He's going to make it come about. And I'm going to endure this affliction that I'm going through. That's how, that's how he's, that's the only, now, you know what faith teachers would do? Here's how you get the promise of God. Four steps, five secrets, two keys. If that was the case, do you not think this would be a pretty good time to put that in there? When he's telling us how to get the promises of God? Imitate those who through faith and endurance inherit the promise. The only way to get God's promises is to continue believing him for those promises and endure whatever hell comes against you. Because that hell coming against you is trying to get you off the course of getting that promise. So if the promise is going to be fulfilled on plan A or road A, the enemy's going to try everything to give you, get you, and to put you on another road. Know what that's called? Making another choice. You know how easy it is. By, so, so you make another choice. This is too hard. I didn't sign up for this. You come over here. Now hell's really going to break loose, but God's going to work on you on this road because He knows He'll get you right back over there sooner or later. Now, you want to be 40 years in the desert? Then go ahead and play your games with God and do what you want to do. When you want to do it, how you want to do it. And then you're going to be 40 years seeing that thing come about. 25 years see that thing come about. That make sense? Now, read on. Next one. When God made his promise, this is verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, he's going to show you something here. How you're going to get through this life and get everything God raised you for. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater than for him to swear by, he swore by himself. In other words, God says, I can't swear by anybody higher than me. There's nobody higher than me. So I'm going to swear by myself, this is what's going to happen in your life, Abraham. Now, when he makes that, I swear to you, I'm going to do this, that takes all the pressure off Abraham. He didn't need to go into that tent to try to help God out. Now watch. Saying, I will surely, not maybe, might, depending upon how you perform, Abraham, no, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, there's that endurance, after enduring, Abraham received what was promised. Next. People swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what is said. So God makes an oath to Abraham and puts an end to all arguments. That's why God gave him the oath so he wouldn't debate. Well, maybe he'll do it, maybe he won't. No, the oath means he will do it. How many times have you taken a promise or something God said he was going to do in your life and then you're like, well, maybe not. It might not happen. It might happen. It might not happen. But if he says it's going to happen, he spoke it and his word is above his name. Psalm says his word is above his name. That's how much you can trust God when he speaks to you, shows you something. So he says, puts an end to all argument. You could also say puts an end to all your fear and frustration and unbelief. God's oath should put an end to your, all your unbelief when you're dealing with his purpose, plans, and promises. Because God wanted to make the... Un now look at this. He puts an end to all argument by giving them the oath, confirming the oath. Now watch. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his what? His purpose is unchanging. The very nature of purpose is unchanging. He wants you to see that his purpose is unchanging. So because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, that's us, he confirmed it with an oath. Next. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie... See there? Impossible for God to lie. If he spoke it before the foundation of the world, it's got to happen. It, and it will happen. Unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie. We who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. So we are encouraged by God's promises. Not See, um, somebody go to 2 Corinthians 1 9, and I'm going to have to go over here and get my Bible because I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you something if you got a second. Because that, that is supposed to be the Amplified. And they gave me the choice of two the new Amplified and the old Amplified. And that ain't right. And I got to prove it to you because I've got the old Amplified right here. 
So you can't trust translators. You don't know what you're reading. And that makes me mad right now. Because that was the part I wanted you to get. They did the same thing to Philippians 2.13 of the Amplified. They screwed around with it and took the best part out. You know why? Because these translators don't have a revelation of God's word, God's character, God's promise, God's nature. They don't have. So they're going to they're gonna interpret the Bible through the Greek by the way they understand God. And that really makes me mad. So that is verse, I think that's verse 18. I don't have it up there, but. Yeah, it is. So verse 18. Now listen to what he says here in verse 18. You ready? That, so who's looking up um, what I say to look up? 2 Corinthians 1.20. All right. This was so that by two unchangeable things. You see how I, I want to read this and I want you to follow that while I read this. You'll see. This was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath. You see that up there? You see that up there? His promise and his oath? If you I've read that for years. His two unchangeable what's unchanged? What two unchangeable things? No translation would clarify that except the amplified. And when I read the amplified, I said, oh, okay, I get it now. This was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath. Took it out. Uh, they should have took it out of the new Amplified. Why'd you take it out of the old Amplified? I'm going to tell you the NIV is the same way. If you've got an old NIV Bible, keep it. you got an old Amplified, keep it. They are screwing up the translations with these new ones. Just telling you the truth. Telling you the truth. It bothers me. Leave it. Okay, make a new one. But don't mess with the old one. They did the same thing with Philippians 2.13. I'm, I'm, I'm just... Anyway, what's, what, what verse now are you at? You want to read it? I can. All right, I want you to read 19 first. You want 19? Yes. Nine. Yeah, 19 and 20, but I want 19 first. I alluded to this on the um, Thursday, well, the Friday replay of a message a year and a half ago. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Sylvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no. Now watch. Now say go say that again. Now listen to what she's saying. Um, was not wait. No, start but over. Okay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you. Okay, they're preaching Jesus. Go ahead. By us, by me, Sylvanus and Timothy, who was not yes and no. Now this now what what's he preaching? But no, no. What's he preaching? Jesus. Jesus. And he's saying this message is not yes and no. No, I've never heard anybody talk about this. What does he mean by yes or no? What, do you understand the new covenant is not yes and no? What covenant is yes and no? The old covenant. And it was based on your performance. So you obey, it's going to be a yes. If you're not obeying, it's going to be a no. But under the new covenant, he says it's not yes and no. Go on. But in him was yes. See? It's not yes and no. Maybe. Is he going to do it for me? Maybe not. It's a yes. Every promise of God that he raised you for, all that's in your inheritance, is never yes, no, maybe. I don't know. It depends. You got enough faith? It's a yes in Christ Jesus. Why in Christ Jesus? He, he fulfilled the law completely, so it's not on you to fulfill. So that now sets you up for the gift of righteousness, and now you're going to get everything coming to you that you were raised for. Now, I can't tell you you're going to get things that you're not raised for. Why would he give a five-year-old a Corvette? There's certain things he's not going to do for you. He's done for others. So take that song. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. That's a lie. No, he won't. Because I, there's a lot of things I want God to do for me. I've seen him do in other people's lives. But guess what? He's not going to do it. Not because there's anything wrong with me. Because it's not according to purpose. He's the potter. You're the clay. And the clay can't say back to the potter, Why are you forming me this way? Make me like T.D. Jakes. I want to be like T.D. Jakes. I want to be like Mike Jordan. I want to be like Mike. 
You, the clay can never say back to the potter, what are you doing? The clay has to sit there and let the potter form him into the image he wants him to. You may be an a, a ashtray. I don't want to be an ashtray, but some clay pots turn into ashtrays. Hmm? I don't know what you... I, I, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be this. I wanted to be that. Dude, that's not what you... You don't even have the intelligence for that because he didn't give you the intelligence for that. You cannot say back, why are you doing this? So therefore, under the new covenant, because of Christ, everything's a yes in your life that has to do with what he's doing in your life. You never have to wonder and worry. Is he going to let you go? Is he not going to fulfill destiny? Whatever. Okay, read the next verse. 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes. So there you go. Yes and amen. The yes is him, the amen comes from you. All the promises of God are yes. So this crybaby stuff that we are trained to do, or selfish stuff, greedy stuff that we're taught to do, go to the, be like the prodigal and get your stuff now! No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Okay? Closing. The world is blind. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Just so you can see this. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Why are you sitting? There is no way I'm going to ever see you in, on the streets being guided by a blind man. Andy, you want, you, you, you want to let a blind man lead you through hiking? He likes to hike. And I got a good God for you. He's blind, though. You can trust him. You want to follow him? Jesus said the blind lead the blind, and where do they end up? In a ditch. So I'm going to be honest with you guys. This is going to be strong, but it's truth. Why are you sitting under? Maybe you don't, but a lot of Christians do. Sit there with bated breath, waiting for the, late, the, the next hour of MSNBC. CNN, Fox, or real religious people. I mean, what, what do you not understand? What do we not understand about the minds of those being blinded? Why would you want to sit under a mind that's blind from God's truth? When truth is Jesus, and that's the only truth we're to live by, why would you want to do that? Those who come to truth, which is Christ, and that would be the church, the saved, has to be the church that's speaking. We're the oracles of God. So why is the church silent or participating in the false narratives we're hearing today? When we're the light, we have the truth. This means that we have to speak up, speak out. Why is that not happening? Why? I'm going to tell you, forget it. It's not going to happen. Because every pastor has something to lose unless he's already died. Died to his life. He's already, he's already counted the cost, like Jesus said. He's put his hand in the plow. He's not going to look back. He doesn't care if his church splits tomorrow because he's not in debt. Oh, wait. No, they are in debt. So they're going to care if their church splits. So they're going to cater to the rich people in the church so they'll, at least if it splits, they keep the rich. So they're going to side with the rich. In the, it is not wise for any minister to get himself into so much debt he can't afford a church split over truth, over truth. Because he'll compromise the truth to keep the crowd and the money. And what have I been saying to you since Trump's been in office? Many things. <laughs> it is time to get out of debt. I'm hoping he's in it four more years, and then I don't know what the economy is going to look like. It's not time to get into debt. The debt's over with. In fact, Paul said, oh, no man, nothing. So I think we need to believe what the Bible says. I know you got a house payment. I get that in the car. But after that, don't, 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 definitely don't be in the credit card. Get out of debt, and no one owns you. See, why, is, why, why say be a lender and not a borrower? Because you'll be owned by that person that, that's, that's lending to you. They'll own you. And we're not to be owned by anybody. 
We're free. I know, that's for free. You may not like that, but that's... The church leadership that will stand up and speak the truth is going to be very small in numbers. But that's okay, because here's it's not, it's, not, it's not up to them anyway. It's up to you and me. What do I mean by that? I said something Tuesday, and I'm going to close with this, that I had not planned to say, but as I was speaking, the Spirit put it in my heart, and I spoke it, and I'm like, wow, that never thought of that one. But every person that threw a brick through a window knows a believer. Every person that beat up somebody knows a believer. Maybe even their grandmother's a believer. Huh? Everybody knows a believer. That's how God designed it. But you know what we do? We look for people like Reinhard Bunke to go out there to the masses and get it done for us. That's never been the case. Jesus went one-on-one. -on -one. He always ministered one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, he'll occasionally sit down and teach a bunch of them, but ministry is one-on-one. -on -one. Peter at the gate called beautiful with that guy, one-on-one. -on -one. Paul, um, what's the guy's name? Ananias, you go to Paul. He's, he's, he's Saul at the time, and I want you to pray for him. One-on-one. -on -one. It's all one-on-one. -on -one. If we go after the people we know, and at least give them the truth, and set them, they may not get saved, but try to at least get rid of the stronghold over their brain that the, that the world has put on them. We'd be a better place. But we are waiting for the pastor to do it, or for a Reinhardt Bonnke to do it, or something. No. Every person that threw a brick knows a believer. Every person out there that's lost and blinded knows a believer. Now, that's you and me. That's you and me. And if someone comes to me, and I've lost people over this. We're not, remember we were doing this the thing, we started the Thursday night, and I said, I will no longer sit down and listen to someone who's a believer tell me their woes. I said, because that's not true of them. And I will say to them, that's not true. This is not true. That's all lies. And I won't, I won't placate that false identity any longer in people. That was a turning point. And we got kicked back on that. But that's okay. Sorry, it's true. I, I can't change truth to accommodate sensitive people. We are the light bearers. We're, don't look for the government to fix anything. You want to fix racism? The government can't. How in the world is the government going to fix it when half of it's promoting it? We, the church, are the ones who can fix this stuff. When the virus came, was the church at the forefront of this thing? Racism. Nope, now the church is jumping on the bandwagon and, and agreeing with everybody on TV. Rather than saying, let's, let's not debate this, let's go higher. There's, there's, there's principalities and powers. This whole thing is, the, is a principality and power. You didn't, you didn't hear that. In fact, a lot of Christian leaders never said that. They just jumped on board with the narrative. Like that's going to fix it. Any problem, I'm only using those because that's what we're seeing and sensing and experiencing, but any problem, who knows what they're going to throw at us this fall? Second wave? I hope you all know now, and I said this, from the very beginning in March, this thing is not as bad as they're saying. And my concern was what the government was going to do to us, not that virus. And now you're seeing they're letting protesters go out there, but won't let you go to church. You're being duped. Why? They're blind, and they're trying to lead you. And if you want to stay blind, they'll lead you into a ditch. Or get the truth of what God's saying and doing, and stand against these falsehoods and narratives, in spite of the persecution that might come your way. Because you're the only light. You, if you dummy up and shut up, who's going to get the light? Who's going to hear the truth? Let me close with this. We're not victims. But we're playing it. We're playing victims. Let us be the victors God created us to be. Look at this next verse. This is Jeremiah talking about Israel. You ready for this? 
she israel did not consider her destiny therefore her collapse was great she lost sight of her destiny well i don't even have one well you better find out what it is because if you can lose sight of it and your collapse is great you're going to be a, a, a great collapse if you don't know it this whole thing i told you from the very beginning ephesians 1 4 you were chosen before the foundation of this world, according to God's purpose, there's plans for your life right now. He spoke before He created this world. It's called destiny. And if you don't consider it while you're living this life, you're going to have a fall. If you remember me telling you, I wasn't even going to plan on saying, you remember me telling you I've got two close friends who died prematurely and they were very strong Christians. And I said, that's their end? That's how they're going to end? <clears throat> What's your end going to look? Is it going to be a collapse because you got you lost sight of your destiny, what you're called for and raised for? By getting over here, playing around, getting screwed up your head about this and that and the other. Both of them. And how many people, they have tra tragic endings? Christians. And he's warning you that if you don't stay focused on what you're raised to, the enemy will get you off of that and then you're in the enemy's territory. Look at this next one. One more. Without a vision, that's your purpose and plan, people perish. Another way, another translation says, they cast off restraints. In other words, there's nothing restraining you to stay focused on a path because you're just all over the place, which is the next translation, they wander aimlessly. If the, if the enemy can get you to wander aimlessly, your collapse will be great. Those who know who they are in God will do great exploits, Second Chronicles says. Those who know their God shall gain strength, do great exploits. They won't wander around aimlessly. They won't cast off restraints because they're a people of vision, purpose, and promise. And you're guaranteed. But the minute you let the enemy get you off, and like we said, if you continue reading Thessalonians, it said that some of them went to the side of Satan. God will do, you understand, God will do everything. I mean, he's done it all. But there's this little tiny place left for us, and it's not much. In fact, he will hem you in to keep you. But if you are so rebellious, and I hate to use that word, but blind, maybe that's the word, blind to the enemy, and then be deluded by his deceptions, and you can't, therefore you cast off for strength, the end ain't going to be good. You'll make it to heaven, but you, 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 you are a casualty down here. Is that possible? That's why Paul said, I buffet my body, I make it my slave, lest I become a castaway. And if Paul could see himself being a castaway, my God, what do you think can happen to us? If we don't stay focused in faith and endure what's happening, endure the light affliction you're going through. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, the enemy is out to get us off, to get us unfocused, to blind us, to get us to wander aimlessly, to, to, to get us to quit seeing our destiny and dream and vision that you've given us, trying to get us off course. But the, Hebrew, but the men and women of Hebrews 11 by faith they endured faith and endurance faith and endurance because they knew God was faithful to perform what he promised and God's purpose is stand strong stand forever and therefore we're going to stand having done all we're going to continue to stand no matter what sorrow pain Affliction. We'll choose those afflictions. They're greater treasures than the treasures of this world. The reproach of Christ is greater riches than what this world can offer you. We say that again. The reproach of Christ is far greater in riches than what riches this world can offer you. We're going to go the way of Christ. We're going to go the way of truth. I don't care how popular it is or how unpopular it is. I don't care if it pays or doesn't pay. None of those factor in to standing on the side of truth.
God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Let this word today find a lodging place in our minds, renewing them and causing us to stand strong in what lies ahead because you're fulfilling destiny right in front of our eyes. We may not know it because we're seeing the affliction, but your purposes are being fulfilled in spite of the evil. We win. We win. Um, anybody have a word or something? Because I'm kind of like um, not give you an opportunity. If anybody's got a word or a comment or something that you want to share, because I'm not feeling the amen yet. So I don't know if anybody's got something. Scripture, something that comes to your mind, a word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we are we are the blessed. We are the blessed. No matter what it feels like or looks like, we are the blessed. And the promises are yes, because we are the blessed. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.